Good day. My name is Teresa Stack. I'm an assistant professor at Montana Tech of the University of Montana, and today we'll be covering lockout tagout. Lockout tagout is under 29 CFR 1910, and that would be subpart J, General Environmental Controls. The title of this specific standard is called the Control of Hazardous Energy, although when we talk about it in general terms, we use LOTO or lockout tagout. And this is an example of an electrical box which has been locked out properly. And here. Oh, wait. Oh, we got two. This is going to be difficult. Got her. Oh, yeah, baby. Two more. Oh, two bangers. We have an example of an operation that was being filmed where there was absolutely no lockout of equipment and that worker was um, at danger of going, getting um, injured. So we'll carry on with this particular presentation. Again, we're talking about energy, and so why not review accident causation theory? And you remember this from either 2246, or we touched it upon it at least two times in this class is that accidents or injuries happen because of this unreleased, unplanned for um, rapid release of energy. And if we use Haddon's strategies to control this release of energy, we can prevent accidents and injuries from happening. And so um, this is an example of another quick and sudden release of energy. So let's go over Haddon's 10 rules again. The first one is just don't do it. Prevent the marshalling of energy. An example for um, lockout tagout procedures would be you don't have the ability to turn the machine on, so you prevent any energy from dissipating or building up. Some other examples are preventing repair and maintenance procedures, so this is specific to lockout tagout, or of course preventing workers from climbing. That's another example. Our second one is to reduce the amount of energy for which is marshaled. So don't have as much of it happen, right? Do less. Keep speeds down. Reduce concentrations. So we don't really reduce the amount of energy when it comes to lockout tagout. We eliminate it. So then the next one would be prevent the release of energy which has been built up or slow it down. How this applies to lockout tagout is that, that you slowly dissipate any possible built up energy before people enter the area. And you, um, some examples of this not related to lockout tagout is of course we um, build guardrails to prevent falls from high places that prevents the release of energy. And we have elevator brakes which slows down the release of energy or can stop it before an elevator falls. And then to slow down the release of energy, an example of this would be um, sloped runways. And so as far as lockout tagout goes, we don't slow it down. We release it slowly or we prevent it from occurring um, completely. So number five is um, for Haddon's rules would be we separate um, the energy or the accident or the energy source or the hazard, right, in time or space. So examples with this would be we prevent entry into a blasting area during periods in which people were blasting, right? We separate pedestrians from vehicles, pedestrians from hazardous chemicals, or only a certain group of workers for, for hazardous care chemicals. And another way that we separate as far as lockout tagout goes is that we, that we um, keep people from moving parts. So number six, put a physical barrier up 
And one way we do this in Lockout Terrier is we do have some kind of barrier between people entering a zone, so only the people who are performing the operation are able to enter the zone. And so you can see that we're moving into, um, that would be all pre-event. Then we have event, modify the contact surface by rounding edges. We don't do this in lockout tagout, but an example would be no sharp edges on equipment or um, you know, a physical barrier as far as um, sports go would be you pad the goalposts. So if you run into them, at least you have some kind of barrier. Eight gets into um, strengthening the object against the release. We don't really do this in lockout tagout, but um, your workers, if they're wearing personal protective equipment, you are strengthening the person against the release of energy. Another way in which you strengthen people is through physical endurance, although this doesn't apply specifically to lockout tagout. You see how it can apply to making a worker less susceptible to injury. So 9 and 10 are what you do um, during the event or, or and post-event. So during the event, can you mitigate the damage? We do this through training. That's how we try to mitigate the damage so people know what to do. Also, um, fire alarm systems or sprinkler systems, that means the event is happening, but we're trying to lessen the blow. And the last one is, of course, um, rehabilitate both the uh, people and the facility and get it back on board as quickly as possible. So here is an example from a web or an Instagram account called OSHA Is This Okay? And you can see in this example that um, here is the way you would turn on the electrical device. So you turn it on and you turn it off. This is actually the way you open the box. And so the lockout tagout device is on the way in which you open the box. And you can see that it, this part is done properly, but it doesn't do anything whatsoever to prevent the accidental turning on of this piece of equipment. So this would be an OSHA fail. You need to lock out and tag out this device so you can't accidentally turn it on. Also, this isn't part of lockout tagout, but it is part of the energy standard. This isn't um, labeled appropriately in this area. So this would be an example of a lockout tagout fail. So we find the control of hazardous energy. That's the title under subpart J. There's also other standards, and I'm just showing you this so that if you go to work in um, maritime industries or longshoring, or construction industries, um, or you're specifically related to different kinds of power systems, there can be a different part that you can um, follow. We will talk about um, general industry subpart S um, during this class. So we'll talk a little bit about electrical system safety. So you can see how lockout, tagout, isolation of a system um, also combines with things like confined space standard, as well as um, the energy standard, so that these boxes are labeled appropriately and people know how to um, lock them out. So the scope of lockout tagout, this is how it differs from machine guarding. Machine guarding, um, the machine is running. People are doing their normal operations. You're using a, a saw to cut something. Lockout tagout covers the servicing of equipment. So it's when there's some kind of maintenance that's going on and equipment has to be completely shut down. Lockout tagout. Um, and it's to prevent the unexpected re-energization -ener of a, uh, a piece of a machinery, so that's turning it back on. It also prevents the release of any stored energy because you bleed out all that energy. And of course, we're hoping that we can um, prevent workers from becoming in energy prevent workers from becoming injured from energy. And here's an example of safety warning. Opening this box will result in um, death by electrocution and of course a fine for opening it. And that is um, sarcasm. So there are some exemptions to when you use the lockout tagout standard, and um, that would be because you do not follow OSHA 1910 for construction. You follow 1926 uh, for agriculture. There are no occupational safety rules for agriculture. Maritime follows another um, standard as well. And oil and well drilling services are listed as best practices and don't actually follow those standards. 
So lockout tagout is generally more for maintenance folks that are within your facility than for um, um, specialized industries. And this is a pretty good example of why lockout tagout is so important um, because as you know, it only takes moments to be pulled in a piece of to be pulled into a piece of machinery and usually the results um, are not very favorable for the employee. So what types of energy are we concerned about? Well, we, we kind of think of the big ones as being electrical energy, hydraulic energy, which is some kind of fluid energy with a piston, um, or pneumatic energy supplied air. But then we also have to think about our chemical processes, chemical energy, people getting burned, thermal explosion, so um, something that's hot or becomes hot, mechanical injury, mechanical energy, including sounds and um, vibration, and then nuclear energy, which we don't talk about a lot here, but is talked about more on the master's level. So the different kinds of energy sources um, that you would try to identify as best you can would be energy that's stored inside a machine. So such as machines that have weights or springs or pistons that are under some type of pressure. Um, and that the, you have to release this pressure so it doesn't cause somebody to become injured. And then chemical injuries, um, chemicals can of course start fire, cause skin burns, or release um, harmful gases. So although you think, well, we're shutting a machine down and it, the process isn't occurring anymore, we don't have to worry so much about the hazard. Sometimes it's in bringing the system back up or when you shut it down that um, through the cooling of equipment, when it starts to um, the molecules become closer together when something cools as opposed to when something is heated up, that can cause the release of energy as well. So we just always proceed with caution um, with the different types of energy. And we try to think of this energy source as what we're going to isolate and what we're not going to isolate. So it's applied to service and maintenance. Employees are required to remove or when employees are required to remove or bypass a guard, um, employees or when employees put their body part into a point of um, into a danger zone. So you're in a place of a machine where you can get pulled in or electrocuted, or you have to bypass a guard to be able to perform the operation. That's when lockout tagout is um, necessary. So then um, other exemptions to performing lockout tab tagout is if there's something really repetitive to the job that's being done. For example, you're constantly lubricating a piece of um, equipment and you don't have to completely lock it, down, lock, lock it out and tag it out. So that might be internal to the production. Um, for um, example, if you have to put ink on a press, you don't have to necessarily lock it out and tag it out every time you do that because it's part of the normal operation and that would be covered under machine guarding. So think about machine guarding as the machine is operating versus lockout tagout. It's being shut down because there's some repair or maintenance operation in place. And um, this would not be an example from lockout tagout, but you can see the way this panel um, is labeled that people wouldn't know what to lock out or tag out. And that's part of electrical safety, but it gets into lockout tag out as well because people have to know what is going to turn a machine off and how to lock it out and tag it out um, appropriately. So it does not apply. You don't have to lock out and tag out a plug so that if you pull the plug and that completely turns the equipment off, you don't necessarily have to lock it out. But they do make these lockout devices for plugs so that somebody doesn't accidentally plug it in and turn it back on again. It's really highly recommended that people do lock out and tag out equipment if they're not close enough to the part of equipment in which um, people can be exposed to. So there are lockout tagouts for plugs. And this would be how you would um, lock it out. You put this over the plug and then put a lock into place. And then lock out, tagged out to show that it's locked out and tagged out. Although this constitutes the tag too.
So although is it, this isn't necessarily your very first um, step, but you have to understand how the um, energy can be released or what kind of energy is there that could be causing people um, or that may cause people to get injured. injured. So you have to identify um, all the points in which energy is being brought into the system or energy can be released. So this isn't necessarily just unplugging something. If, for example, you have a bunch of built up pressure or a bunch of built up energy in a capacitor, you have to be able to identify that so you can bleed it off. And um, most places have really strict lockout tagout procedures that are pre-written so that it doesn't have to be identified on the fly, which means, you know, like, where people don't have a whole bunch of planning for it. And I could um, pretty much guarantee that you may do something like this or material safety data sheets in your um, internship because it's really good for people who are just getting into the industry to become familiar with all the different equipment that's being used as well as how it's locked out and tagged out. And you can see here in this picture, this picture is a really good um, example of something that is locked out and tagged out appropriately. So right here in this area, that's the switch that's in the off position. And then you have um, these two connectors on there and a bar so that you can't possibly turn that back on again. And then again, a lock with a tag, locked out and tagged out. And the lock is kept with the employee who is actually um, performing the work. Um, and then this is an example of when you have multiple employees that are performing work. So you would use a device like this where you could see all the different holes so that every employee has their own key and they have their own lock. And it's the system is turned off and then locked out. And then each employee that is going into that space or might be exposed to that hazard has to um, lock it up. then you would, of course, take the key. Another way in which this is done is that then all these keys, well, this is how we did it in Hazmat, everybody would give their key to a supervisor, and he would put it in a box and lock that box. So the supervisor would have the lock box, and the only time you were able to get your key back is when everybody was out of the space, and it was deemed clear, and it was safe to put the, uh, um, turn the equipment back on again. And generally speaking, this may seem like overkill to you, but in a place like um, Coal Strip, where they have over 2,000 confined spaces, you may have people that are um, a couple of football fields apart that are maintaining and working on the same piece of equipment. They may not have direct eye contact with somebody or not understand the other part of the process. And then um, you it's one way to ensure that everybody knows what everybody else is doing because it's actually a physical barrier think of this as an engineering control not an administrative control or personal protective equipment so it is our first line of defense and then this is an example of a valve lock so you, so you can't uh, turn a valve you can put this over the valve Oop, it just came apart and then for one person you have one lock and tagged or for multiple people. And the picture that you see here is where um, you don't have any way to put like a valve lock on these. So you have the two um, valves turned to the right direction so they can't be turned on and they come together into this junction box and they're, they're wrapped around like a big grommet so that you can't accidentally pull them through and then it is locked and tagged, locked and tagged out. So items that you need, um, you need a written lockout tagout standard operating um, procedure, that's an SOP for all equipment or confined spaces which would be um, entered. So part of identifying that and the risk in which people would be exposed to them is um, part of your occupational safety and health program. It's something that you do. You need locks and tags that can be identified by the worker. So um, they can be color coded. They could have numbers on them um, so that each worker knows what their lock is and what their key was. 
you need uh, ways in which you can lock it out um, appropriately depending on what you are locking out. So this is for like a power box. Um, power box where you have the breaker that goes up and down. <clears throat> this is really a great um, example of where the lockout tagger procedure is identified for different areas and then it usually is either posted like in a book, not like in a book, it's posted in a book, or um, the way they did it at Montana Precision, it was um, attached to each piece of machinery. So if we kind of scroll down here, you could see that um, E1 is this piece of equipment. It tells you that it's a 4,400 volt source of energy. The way that you'd lock it out with a, is with a padlock. It tell you um, where, um, where you need to isolate that point um, and what kind of method is being used. So you have to move electrical disconnect into the number one position or off and lock it out. And a check for it would be attempt to restart where um, your check for one or the other of these water valves is visually verify that the pressure gal the pressure valve is on zero. So this is an example of a really well done lockout tagout system. And you can see that it even shows you um, where you might be at risk of burns or chemicals um, because of kinetic or thermal injury. Kinetic energy, of course, isn't thermal heat, but where you can be exposed to heat here or energy from pieces of equipment that are moving. So this shows you inside of a facility what a lockout tagout um, standard operating procedure would look like. It doesn't have to be complicated to be really effective. So some circuit breaker kits that these are locked out um, and tagged out appropriately. This one is appropriate because the tag is on the lock. It's locked in a position that there's no way that you can turn this back on again. So there's 10 steps to lockout tagout procedure. Um, these are all really important and important that they're done in proper order. So you prepare for shutdown by understanding um, the equipment that you're going to shut down and notifying all people in the area that it will be shut down because shutting down one piece of equipment can affect people in other areas of a plant. Then you shut down the equipment using the normal shutdown process and disable any energy sources that you can, which means that um, can you shut down the power switch or pull out a plug, um, isolate all energy sources, so then you would close all the valves or um, areas that are leading into there as well, so it's not just shutting down the piece of equipment, it's shutting down the surrounding equipment that may feed into it and cause a hazard. And then step four is placing the locks and the tags onto the equipment that has been turned off. And these are all pictures of where um, it has been done um, appropriately. So you have your power box that's locked out with the hasp and everybody's key is on there and it's labeled. Then you have another power box that's locked and tagged out. The tag is here and you can write on this with like a um, wax pencil. Um, and then this is a ball valve lock, so the butterfly clamp is on there, so you can't accidentally turn it on. And a lot of the newer pieces of equipment, lockout tagout equipment, um, is or places where lockout tagout can be um, attached is built into it, but on older pieces of equipment that isn't necessarily there. So number five is probably the most important step, and the step that um, is missed, you know, lock it, tag out, and consider it good to go. But there could be capacitors that could be storing energy that need to be discharged, right? Because you can still get a shock from something, even if the power has been turned off, if there's energy stored into it. You block anything that's elevated, elevated parts, so if they do lose their hydraulic pressure, they don't fall on people. Stop the rotation of flywheels. So sometimes, you know, like if you think you turn your fan off, the fan blade still spins. You want to make sure that was a full rotational stop so you can visually check that it has been turned off. Um, take all the pressure out of the system, drain fluids that need to be drained, vent gases that need to be vented so that it doesn't vent while people are in the space. 
And sometimes you have to allow pieces of equipment to cool down before you're able to go in and do the repair work. So it's definitely a patient process and not something that you do just um, immediately. Go in and get it done. Many electrical devices store power in batteries or capacitors, and there's still the risk of being shocked by the equipment even after it has been unplugged, so you're not only worried about it accidentally being turned on, but is there any way in which that energy can be transferred into the individual? And that's what you see here in the um, arc flash explosion. A hot pipe or a pressure tank that is, or a tank that's under pressure can still carry energy even when the energy source has been disconnected. So you have to make sure that you drain all the energy. That was step five, and that's a really important step there. That is sometimes missed. People lock out, tag out, and then they feel that they're good to go. These are examples of lockout, tag out fails. Um, this right here, they're locking out, opening up the box, which opening up the box is not going to ultimately kill you. It would be throwing a switch. And a piece of tape isn't considered a physical barrier. It can certainly fall off. Um, I don't know what that lock is doing there, hanging in space. So then step six, again, one that is kind of forgotten, is to verify that the equipment has been isolated, that workers are out of the um, work area, and that you can't, that you've isolated all the energy sources that are in place. And then this is an example, of course, of where um, improper lockout tag out, the tag is on the hasp which can be taken off by anybody. You want somebody to physically have to take off a lock with a key and that person is the person who's going in the space and whose life depends on the lockout tag out system. So seven would be after you lock out tag out is that you actually test it. You try to turn it back on again and see whether the system will energize. So you hit the on button a couple of times and if you've isolated all the energy, then the system doesn't turn back on. And this is um, from um, the OSHA website. A 37-year-old escalator mechanic, George, died when he was crushed in an escalator while performing maintenance. George had removed the escalator stairs and crawled inside the mechanism of the escalator. A co-worker dropped the escalator's electrical current box. This triggered a delay and sent power to the escalator. The stairs began moving. George could not get out before the power was turned off. There were no locks or tags on the power controls to the escalator. The disconnect switch at the current panel that fed power to the elevator had not been locked or tagged out. No blocks or mechanical devices had been used to keep the escalator from moving. So our step eight, or um, our step eight, we, um, if you tried to turn it on, then you put it back in the off position, even if it didn't go on. And that's so when you finally do turn it on, it won't be in the on position. So like, think about a light switch. I take my light switch and I turn it off and then I turn off the power and then I lock that out. And then I go over to the light switch and I turn it on. And if the light switch doesn't go on, I'm good to go. That was step seven. Then I turn that switch back off again. That is step eight. Step nine is you perform the task. And then for step 10, um, you kind of do it in the reverse order. You make sure that the all the equipment is back assembled again, or your workers make sure, because you won't be doing that. But you'll be training your workers in lockout, tag out. All the equipment has been pulled out um, over at Coal Strip. They count all the equipment that goes into a confined space. So, you know, six screwdrivers, two hammer, hammers, and a partridge in a pear tree went into that space. And then they have a checklist and they check that box and make sure everything has come back out again so that it's not left in there accidentally. And when it's turned back on, that's what causes equipment to malfunction. There's really a lot of checks and balances when you're putting a human and something in a space that shouldn't necessarily be there. And then ever after everything is removed and you verify that it's safe to turn the equipment back on again, um, each person removes their own lock and then you're able to re-energize the source. So first you have to make sure everything is accounted for and for really complicated jobs, there's checklists for that. A 52 year old welder died when he was crushed to death by a hydraulic door on a scrap metal shredder. 
Jeff was trying to remove a jammed piece of metal from the hydraulic door. The system's energy had not been released, so it was turned off, but the door still had energy in it. Pistons and things hold energy. And it had not been blocked off. Jeff had not de-energized and locked out the machine. He cut the jammed piece of metal with a torch. The jam fell away and the door closed on him. The company did not require a supervisor's visual confirmation of de-energized and locked out tagged out equipment prior to maintenance work. So who can remove um, locks and tags? Only the employee who placed them there um, or a supervisor after obtaining permission from the employee who placed them on there, or though that isn't highly um, something that we really like to practice in occupational safety and health. Instead, it'd be much better that to just remove the equipment, remove, have the worker remove it, put it back in their pockets. And you may see people walking around campus who have locks on their belts and wonder what they are. They're their own locks that they carry with them or in some other maintenance facility, maybe not on campus. A shipyard worker was preparing to replace a high-pressure steam valve that was faulty and leaking in an engine room. The valve was part of a 600 PSI steam system on a vessel. Other shipyard personnel had previously located all the valves and drains and isolated the steam system according to the ship's as-built drawings. All the drains indicated on the as-built drawings of the ship were open and depressurized. The drains were then marked with tags. As one of the workers loosened the bolts around the faulty valve, a tremendous burst of steam was suddenly released. The steam under high pressure at 385 degrees Fahrenheit knocked the worker to the ground and produced third degree burns on more than 60% of his body. The worker died two days later in the hospital. Errors and omissions on the ship's as-built drawings had prevented shipyard personnel from completely isolating and draining the steam system. Let's take a look at some of the contributing factors that led to this fatality. Use a thermal gun or carefully place your hand near both sides of the valve to check the temperature. Verify that the steam system is drained and the drain valve is open. Be careful not to touch the pipes or valve too quickly. Approach them slowly to feel if heat is radiating from them first. If they are very hot, then they may still contain steam under pressure. Accurate drawings free from discrepancies are essential for effective energy isolation. Shipyard personnel should be properly trained to conduct a visual check of all drains and valves in a steam system that is to be drained and depressurized. Drain connections on all dead interconnecting systems must be opened and observed to ensure effective isolation. Employees authorized to perform steam system repairs should be directly involved in the isolation and lockout tagout of the system. Direct involvement by workers in the lockout tagout process ensures their understanding of the operation or process hazards that the lockout tagout is designed to control and how to avoid or control these hazards. It is essential for ship's personnel and repair contractors to communicate and coordinate about the isolation and lockout tagout of the ship's systems. So that is the end of lockout tagout training. Remember that's part of um, general environmental controls. And I hope you have a pleasant day. Think spring.